welcome to the King's Fund's first virtual conference on population health. Our vision for population health is that health inequalities and health outcomes will be on par with the best in the world. This is going to require a consistent and coherent approach across local, regional and national levels and across many partners, including the government, NHS, charities, businesses, local people and many more. Over the course of the day, we'll have panel discussions. You can ask lots of questions to speakers. There'll be resources on our virtual exhibition stand. And please do network with others using live chat. And there'll be tech support for you if needed. We've got an exciting lineup of speakers and hundreds of people registered. So do use the opportunity to explore your role and that of others for population health. Your discussions will inform our future work at the King's Fund. Please do give us feedback at the end of the sessions. Uh, we'll send you a survey. And finally, most importantly, hope you really enjoy the day. Hello everyone and welcome to our virtual conference. Uh, this is our first session where we're going to be talking about how we get the right people around the table working together for population health. I'm Alex Bayliss, I'm Assistant Director of Policy here at the King's Fund, uh, and we've got a panel of four, four experts who can uh, help us uh, explore this topic and understand the issues. So let's, let's meet our panel. Uh, Alex, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, yeah. I'm Alex Bax. I'm Chief Executive of a charity called Pathway, and we've created a national network of services working with homeless patients in hospital and build out from that to think about the issues relating to homelessness and health. Great, thank you. Nicola? Hi, I'm Nicola Kay. I lead on personalised care at NHS England and NHS Improvement, where we're looking to empower people, integrate services around the individual, uh, give people more choice and control about the care and support they receive, um, and uh, uh, through the comprehensive model of personalised care. Thank you. Uh, Isabel? Hi, I'm Isabel Young. I'm Programme Manager at the Young Foundation, and we are a research organisation social investor and community development practitioner, and we're working to support more connected and sustainable communities across the UK. Thank you. And Sally? Hi, I'm Sally Burlington. I'm Head of Policy at the Local Government Association, and we work to represent councils in England, and also we run a care and health improvement programme that supports councils and their partners to improve health and care locally. Great, thank you. So we've got a, quite a range here covering the statutory bodies across NHS and local government, but also perspectives from the third sector and communities and, and people. So we really need you to put your questions to the panel. Uh, you can do that online uh, and also feel free to tweet on hashtag, hashtag KF online. Uh, but while we're waiting for your questions, let's get started. So uh, Alex, your your charity is quite a specialised charity dealing with quite a discrete population group. How do you even get a voice to be heard? How do you get a seat at the table as, as, as a charity? I think that, well, that's a very good question. It's a, it's a real challenge and we are a very small charity. We've tried to work, we've tried to work at every level really. So, so we have a very eminent board, so we try and connect at the top line with the Department of Health and NHS England as far as we can. Mm -hmm. We've grown a, a national network of clinical colleagues, which we've called the Faculty for Homeless and Inclusion Health. So I have 1,800 colleagues on an email list who give us some clinical credibility and we can summon up their views and their voice to make us sound more credible when we speak nationally. In the reverse, we're also empowering them to feel comfortable to go out and try and engage at their more local level with their system. So we run our own events and conferences to try and share thinking, lessons, ideas. To, to help them both understand how the he health system is currently put together and think about how they can engage. And then at the grassroots level and in our teams, so we're f core to our thinking is that patients need to be centrally involved in their own health and their own care. And that's part of the therapeutic thinking about homelessness, but it's also part of what we've done as a charity to always build lived experience perspectives in at every level. So we have an Experts by Experience project that we've run for some years and we bring care navigators into the NHS who are people with long-term experience of homelessness to work with patients. So we try and keep ourselves honest and then using those networks we try and support those voices and other voices to come into the world of commissioning and to the locality level. But it's hard because the NHS is so big. And, and I guess we, we work, therefore, through lots of other charities or support other third sector partners 
we've become a bit of a gateway for other homeless charities into the NHS. And that's great too. So we work with other charity sector partners to bring them into the conversations with commissioners when we can. So it sounds like building networks, almost like building a social movement of, yeah. of, of clinicians yeah. actually working in the services and people with lived experience of homelessness yeah. seems, seems key to and your approach. to support them up, up and down the system appropriately to try and work out what the points of engagement can be and, and to some extent where the power is and then obviously where the money is and what you can influence. And, that, and that's one of the really big challenges of knowing who to engage with yeah. and how to, yeah. how to reach the right person. Yeah. Um, Nicola, I wonder if I, could, if I could use that as a bit of a segue to you, because uh, from NHS England, we're hearing lots of really good uh, intentions and plans in the long-term plan around working with communities, around working across not just the NHS, but also with local government. And uh, I guess some people would say, well, we heard some of this before with the five-year forward view and the impact was a bit variable. Some areas great, others not. What, what's going to be different this time with the long-term plan? I think there are a few areas where we think things are going to be different this time. So first of all, uh, community-based support is a core part of the operating model for personalised care. Um, and we know that asking people what matters to them, uh, giving people time through social prescribing, link workers, um, and connecting people up to their community can really benefit people. So it's a core part of that model. And in the long-term plan, we committed to personalised care being one of the five major changes to the NHS over the next five years. So we have that a really core to the way that the NHS will be transformed. Another way we think it's going to be different is we've been able to put more investment into social prescribing this time as well. So um, I think it, over the five years, around half a billion pounds to support uh, local areas to employ social prescribing link workers to give people that time to have that conversation and to connect them up to the community. And we're also able to build people's skills as well around some of these community connections, uh, making links between different parts of the system. So both uh, we're working with system leaders uh, to develop these skills, uh, to help people develop connections and uh, communities of change, and also peer leaders as well. And we're developing our peer leadership development programme uh, to enable people with lived experience to really connect up with their local community um, and the local health service as well. So, so when you say you're building it into the operating model. That, that sounds like fundamentally changing the way the NHS works. Is that, is that where in, NHS England is coming from? Is that the sort of message you're giving to the NHS of fundamentally change your day-to-day -day practice so that it's not just within the NHS but is reaching out? That's what we're looking to do through personalised care is a real change. So it's a real cultural change for the NHS. As I mentioned before, around really empowering people, giving people more choice and control, putting people at the heart. That's quite a different conversation uh, to potentially what people are used to uh, when using services. And when we have that different conversation with people, we often draw quite different conclusions about what support people need. Um, so through those conversations, understanding how different parts of the system, including local government, including community support, can really help support people and actually respond uh, to, to their preferences and their needs and things. So it definitely is quite a different approach. Um, and it will require quite a lot of different parts of the system really to work together to enable that to happen. And, and we're only a few months into the long-term plan, so this is a clear direction that you're, that you're setting for the next few years. Absolutely, over the next five years. And we also um, talked in long-term plan about, um, so we've committed to 2.5 million people benefiting from personalised care by 23-24. We mentioned around doubling that as well, the five years beyond. So this really is quite a, a long-term investment we want to make in the NHS. Thank you. So, so Isabel, uh, this all sounds absolutely great, but we have been here before, haven't we? Everyone says involving communities, working with, with patients, empowering them. Who's going to disagree with that? But why is it so difficult? I mean, why, why doesn't it happen? I think that's a really important question and also a, a very broad one. So I'll try and touch on a few things there. I think first it is important to recognise the intention there. So there are some really inspiring examples of different you know, local governments taking that initiative to think, you know, we do need to work with people at different levels and take that systems-based approach, as you mentioned, Nicola. But there are so many reasons why it is so challenging. And I think one of the main ones is, you know, what do we mean when we talk about community and how do we engage them? We're talking about different communities across the UK and there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. But what we can do is think about the engagement tools that we are using. So making sure we're tapping in with people who are experts in that area and being as creative and engaging as possible. And even more important than that, ensuring that the people that we're talking to, when we're finding out what matters to them in terms of their health and well-being, that they're feeling listened to and they also know and are being fed back what is being done with that information. How is that influencing changes in population health? Um, and that said as well, the ways in which we communicate that. 
I think there are some challenges to, to overcome in terms of the types of language that we use. Um, and I think we can do some work across the sector to think about the type of language and making it more inclusive. Um, and I think another thing is to recognise this kind of disruptive power model. It's very difficult to go from that intention to the, to the realities of working in this different way. So when you talk with people about what matters to them in terms of their health and well-being, it is very much is those wider determinants. It's their housing, it's their relationships, it's their local spaces. We need to listen to that, support them to kind of really build on those strengths and then think about which players do we need to get involved? How do we talk with housing? How do we talk with the NHS? So really thinking about how we're facilitating that sharing of power. Um, so those are the challenges and obviously the solutions perhaps I can touch on later. <laughs> And that's so interesting because, of course, the traditional model is that individual services may consult with their service users. But mm -hmm. what we're talking about here is actually sharing that information, that insight across the system and, and getting the system to work together as opposed to just one little bit of it listening to the patients or service users. Absolutely. Yeah. And, that, and that will help overcome another issue in that. You know, people in communities feel over-consulted. They are asked time and time again about their health from all different aspects, whether it's their physical health or their mental health, or as we do in terms of talking about those, those wider determinants. So we have that information. We're hearing about people's voices and lived experiences every day. So how then do we take those learnings and work together across the sector to really you know, support people and drive change? Okay. Sally, um I'm always conscious when we have these discussions that a lot of this feels very new for NHS folk, but to local government uh, organisations, probably feels quite old hat because you've been to quite a lot of this community engagement for many years. How does that join up with what the NHS is now wanting to do and, and what, what are the key uh, capabilities that local government is bringing uh, to, the, to the party? Thank you. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. Local government has always felt deeply connected to its communities and is firmly rooted in the work that needs to happen with people individually and in those communities. And elected councillors are based in their wards and want to speak for, for their local residents. So the work of councils has always been uh, very outward facing to communities and engagement has been a really impo important part of that. Um, and when you look at social care and those types of services actually work on personalisation and um, the focus of services around people to make the biggest difference and co-production with those people has been a big part of mainstream work for a long time. Um, but that's one of the reasons we really welcomed the vision that was set out in the five year forward view and the work that Nicola and her team are doing on personalisation and so on. Nevertheless, you point to some of the challenges about how we um, gain consensus about how best to do that everywhere. And um, it's definitely the case that local government over the last nine or so years has really struggled due to financial um, austerity to keep putting the amount of investment into the voluntary sector which is an absolutely key part of getting engagement right um, that, that it used to um, and we also I think are still working out exactly how best to work across our partnerships in each area through STPs and integrated care systems, through health and wellbeing boards, making the most of those because they're the only place where um, all the statutory services come together with a real responsibility um, for the health and wellbeing of their lo local populations, trying to make sure all those different levels connect up um, and build consensus about how to engage well. And I think each of the panellists has talked about different aspects of that, but it's very multi-layered. And actually, as you said as well, there's no one size fits all. It needs to look different in every area. It's, it's not... It's not the case that the fact it looks different is a bad thing. Actually, you need to shape it around what local communities need and want. So, so I'm getting a picture from all of you that actually some of this is pretty complicated uh, and, and um, hard to navigate. So I'm just going to put you on notice, just so you've got a bit of thinking time, that we've had a question uh, come through which says, uh, there are various examples of good practice, but what would you see as the really essential things that a local system should be trying to put in place to get the connections right? Have you got any examples that you can think of? So I'm going to plant that and come back to it so you've got a bit of time to, to uh, think of an example. Uh, 
but I wanted to go into some of the questions that we're already getting from uh, our audience. Uh, and one of the questions, which I think I'll put to you, Nicola, first of all, is about the role that regulators have in joining the dots uh, in population health. Uh, and I imagine that behind this question is uh, uh, the potential for regulators to actually skew attention back into individual organisations and performance targets when maybe they need to be thinking about the whole system. How, how is, what's NHS England's view on that? Yeah, it is a challenge, I agree. I think it's a really interesting question to raise. Um, we know that it can often be the case that individual organisations are focused upon and then have to meet those targets and that's the way that the kind of regulation works. But we are trying to work with the national regulators to, to see how we can look across some of those services and, and bring things more around the person. Um, so it's something that we, we, want to, we want to work with. We're also engaging with a lot of people with lived experience in some of that, in some of that work as well um, around kind of their, their experience of care and how that was different for them and how can that be built into the kind of inspection regime and things to kind of get a different voice there to kind of really kind of bring that angle into the way that works. So it's definitely a priority for us to work on that over the next few years, but it will take some time to kind of, to make sure we're fully embedding this. We've done quite a lot of work already around primary care, um, around making sure that particularly some of the elements of personalized care are really looked for around some of that kind of inspection and that should hopefully help encourage those relationships to be built and really move in that direction. So I think we, we are trying to move in the right direction, but I can understand that, it, that sometimes that might be a frustration. So it sounds like you're quite engaged with us. You recognise the issue. Yeah, yeah. we do. And, but we're always also um, interested in examples where people have really found that frustration and we can kind of try and help kind of unpick that as well where we need to. So we don't always hear about all those, mm. th those examples there that, um, where people are finding it pulling away from what they're trying to do around integration. And Sally, you mentioned... Uh, Austerity. I mean, because sometimes it's, it's not just the national bodies; it's the whole national policy arena that can cause challenges. Uh, how how are councils coping with that and managing to actually play their part in population health? Oh gosh, well, in all kinds of ways. Um, so, as I said, it's uh, we've definitely been affected by austerity and um, councils have had to prioritise those programmes of work that are statutory by law um, and that tends to mean um, those types of support that are at the most acute, um, most intensive end and it makes it harder to fund um, the kind of discretionary services often through the voluntary sector which we know are, are most effective in some cases at really shifting population health and supporting people um, to keep healthy and um, kind of adapt the, the lifestyle and other changes um, which, which can make a big difference. Nevertheless, up and down the country you see great examples of um, projects, often through um, system-based uh, collective activity. So there's a really good example in Rotherham through the Health and Wellbeing Board which aimed to tackle social isolation, which we know is actually a, a significant um, impact on health and well-being and, and, and mortality rates um, and that had a great impact and also took the pressure, pressure off the NHS and evaluations have, sh have shown that so there are still very good examples up and down the country of where there's good work happening but it is much harder at a time of austerity. You, you, you say that the third sector is, is often the best place to provide these services so I'm, I'm going to come to uh, Alex and Isabel now. Uh, Alex how optimistic are you that there will be funding available to enable the third sector to, to play its part? I think that's... I, one can't help being slightly cynical. It slightly feels like the NHS is... I mean, it has done before, is turning outwards a bit and saying, oh, goodness, this voluntary sector stuff is so helpful. We get, we get this. Unfortunately, with 10 years of austerity, the voluntary sector has experienced huge falls in revenue. And when you turn to a poor community, you'll find very, very little social infrastructure. And what I guess one of our experiences is we then, we find kind of the NHS in particular, but other bits of the system expecting the voluntary sector to be there. And, oh, can you just send me an expert patient? Can you engage? But there's no infrastructure and there's no money mm. to support the core costs of keeping any kind of organisation going. And these things are funded on a, on a mean, if you like, minuscule pay-as-you-go basis expecting these community organisations just to, to somehow exist by themselves, and particularly in our poorest communities. It's unfair. It just, it's, it's impossible almost with, with the amount, the, the lack of funding and infrastructure support there 
turning that the other way around, the NHS as, as a set of institutions across the country could play an amazing role in, in really thinking about becoming part of that social infrastructure. So there are kind of some leading edge primary care practices building out from the, the job of being a GP practice and adding all sorts of other services, which in a way used to, be, used to exist elsewhere, but because they've collapsed, you, you find some great primary care services beginning to build stuff back because they have to, but it feels quite marginal. And, the, and the, the willingness of the NHS to invest in things which are a little bit risky or a little bit further out than mainstream healthcare is, well, we, we're yet to see much of that, I think. So maybe I could just follow on from that, because there's been a question that's been put to us about um, uh, the role that, that charities can have in actually acting as a bit of a bridge between the different statutory yeah. organisations and, and facilitating yeah. sharing of information. I, I wondered if you could say a little bit about your experience of that, of, of, of how that works or what your sort of learning is from having been in that, in that position. I mean, certainly it is. So at, at the operation level, so we create specialist pathway teams in hospitals and at the practical level creating a, a multidisciplinary team in a hospital one of the key things it simply does is connect housing colleagues from local government health colleagues from the system and all the local charity sector who will often be there trying to help homeless patients and actually physically bringing them together and then you discover they've all got little goodies in their coffer which actually if you can enable some dialogue begins to be mobilized to the benefit of the patient. So at the, the operational level, that's visibly the case. At the higher level, trying to then connect between the commissioners in a place, yes, the, again, one finds very often you're saying, well, have you met the housing colleagues? And you discover the health commissioner has never realized that there's a housing commissioner and you're, just, you're introducing, literally introducing people. But it takes a long time and again, as a, as a small charity, no one wants to pay. F no one, no one in the statutory sector sees that value or wants to pay for it. The kind of, there's, there's a general expectation where well, we must just exist and we just do this stuff, and that's really hard. Uh, but what you're also um, painting a picture of is, is I think, of the value of that coming from the bottom up, as opposed yeah. to just just the yeah. central bodies saying you, you have to talk to each other. Actually, making yeah. it real comes from the bottom so up. One of our teams. In a, in a London borough, it was, the, it was the team got going and then invited the director of housing to one of their meetings who then said, my God, this is really interesting. Can I? And then he connected back up to the hospital and some dialogue happened which had not been happening before, but it was seeing a really practical day-to-day -day intervention on the grassroots which, which brought more senior attention. And that's back to what I was saying at the beginning, kind of try, we try and work at, at every angle to try and create change. So if you've got some practice, it really helps to show people that you can do something as well as, and, and, and then you've got to focus for those dialogues to start. So, so let's stick with this for a minute, that the, 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 the mechanics of the actual structures and processes that can be effective in a local place to, to bring people together. So we've had a question about health and wellbeing boards, for example, uh, and their, their ongoing role. But Isabel, I wonder if I could start with you about what, what's your observations on, on the sorts of processes and structures that need to be in place locally so that actually there is a coordinated way of getting insight from local communities and involving people uh, and using that insight. Yeah, I think it definitely picks up on a lot of what, of, of what Alex has already touched on. Um, it's, there's a few ways of doing it. So I think in terms of inverting the power model that we usually follow, so rather than inviting representatives from communities into the commissioning space or into the space with services, we turn that round and we invite the commissioners in or the services in to hear from communities where they, they are dominating and determining the conversation. I think as well the, the role of us as uh, the third sector is to really be that catalyst and to really create those spaces for dialogue because it's not, it doesn't seem to be happening on its own. And I think um, that we can really kind of spark that conversation. And also the, the type of skill sets that we have in terms of pivoting between conversations. So the things that we are hearing when we are out and about, when we're knocking on doors and hearing from the voices of people who perhaps aren't entering that, that more typical um, health creation space, we can hear that and then feed it back. So it's how are we nurturing relationships, how are we taking what we're hearing and how are we just you know, doing things a little bit differently. But it takes some coordination. Mm. So perhaps as you were saying, we are do we're all doing more with less. 
So how, really it's about instilling that idea of all of us working together. So us supporting local services and parts of the system to think a bit differently and to think more collaboratively. I think you know one of the big challenges we've come across um, aside from the residents in terms of, of local stakeholders, for example, they are also feeling the effects of austerity. So how can we support them to think a little bit differently with the resources that, we, that we're all competing for but could share a bit differently? So I suspect we'll come back to this question of mm -hmm. what's the sort of leadership you need to manage those relationships and, and affect that culture change. Yeah. Um, but, but Sally, can I put it to you bluntly, are health and well, do health and wellbeing boards have a future? Are they, are they achieving what they need to? Well, we've actually recently published a report which looked in depth at 22 health and wellbeing mm -hmm. boards. Um, it's called, I think, What a Difference a Place Makes. Um, and <laughs> thank you. Um, it's, uh, and it picked up quite a lot of what you were saying, Isabel, in terms of n needing that connection. And um, it shows that there's a, there is still a great deal of variation between health and wellbeing boards and how they operate. Um, they, but they are... And, and for the time being will remain the only place where the statutory partners have to come together and talk about health and well-being. So they are the only place where that strategic um, conversation is happening in every area. Um, some of them, uh, many of them actually have um, the voluntary sector represented on the board um, and, and that's one way in which you can try and make sure that kind of ongoing dialogue happens about what's needed in local communities. Um, but they are variable and we, we, we need to make sure that um, in every area we, we are all setting an expectation that they connect with the sustainability and transformation partnership or the integrated care system in, in each place and one of the things our, our report does is look at how that's working in different footprints because those footprints of the STP or ICS don't match don't health and wellbeing boards but areas are finding ways to make that work um, and one of the things I would suggest is that um, although things are difficult, structural change isn't going to be the solution. It's relationships that are the solution and, and making sure you've got leadership that is working well together and picking up the phone to each other and making sure they're, they're all working on the same page and to the same set of outcomes. So in terms of addressing that variation between health and wellbeing boards, is, is the key message you're giving, look on the LGA website for your, for your guidance or are there other things that people should be doing to well, I, I wouldn't <laughs> suggest our website is the the panacea for, for everybody but there's a lot of stuff on there and we also uh, run a support program which um, health and wellbeing boards can access okay thank you so the other new structure that's um, coming about locally Nicola uh, is primary care networks uh, what role do they have in population health how do you see them developing their role I think it's quite a significant role and we've already seen some primary care networks really kind of taking that and really kind of running with it. But they are in quite different places at the moment. So some local areas will have kind of built very strong relationships over time and others are more nascent. So we have to be uh, bear in mind there is variability. Um, but we do work closely with them. As I, as I mentioned, we've invested a lot of money in them around the social prescribing link workers in particular in this space to encourage that, that different conversation, that time for people who could really do with that, that time to talk about what matters to them outside a potential more traditional GP appointment. That they may not have those medical needs, but may have those sorts of wider needs that are best served through, that, through, them, through social prescribing. We have seen a great example um, in Sheffield, for example, where they've looked at um, segmenting the population in the primary care um, in primary care around people's levels of knowledge, skills, and confidence. So people's levels of activation to, to manage their long-term conditions, particularly starting with diabetes, and then they're able to offer much more bespoke, tailored service depending on what level people are at in terms of their activation. So they can really target the right services on the right people, because um, we've found with people with low levels of knowledge, skills, and confidence to manage their long-term conditions. They really struggle to go straight to that very medical conversation and they actually might need other things first and actually a chance to kind of talk about the social and other issues really benefits them before they're able to kind of move on to the kind of managing sort of more the medical needs. So the work they've done there is a really good example of how um, population health management can work in primary care through that segmentation and that targeting of resources and to create a more sustainable model. So it's very much based around understanding the health needs of the mm -hmm. local population and then, and then targeting their, their, their efforts differently to different mm -hmm. parts of the population. Yeah. One of the um, things about the NHS is that 
people tend to think in terms of medical models like mm -hmm. providing clinical services. And I wondered what your view is around the role of the NHS as an anchor institution. Uh, because people quite often talk about NHS trusts as being such an important part of the local economy and the fabric of the local community, uh, which is a value it brings, which is not just about its clinical services. Is that something that you see uh, developing over the next few years? I do think it's important. Um, the NHS is a, you know, often a very big employer locally, um, so it's not just the people um, who've got health needs, but also the um, people working in the NHS. It's an opportunity um, for them to... Um, uh, we're, so we're thinking about how do we personalise, how do we provide more personalised care to NHS staff as well in those sort of situations, you know, helping them raise their levels of activation um, and um, access community services as well. So, and we, so we do see it as quite an important part of the community, um, potentially the, um, uh, the particularly primary care will know their population, they'll know um, the, the risk, they'll know people's history, but we also see pop people popping up in different parts of the system as well, so not necessarily um, at the GP surgery, but also through pharmacists, we also work with other wider services, so we're talking to the fire service, probation and things like that to understand what issues people are facing that potentially we could um, address better um, and through that kind of that that different conversation through personalised care, um, so I think it's sort of it is an anchor institution, but I think to be seen in that kind of wider context of other services that people are getting as well. Uh, Isabel, does that chime with you? What what do you, what do you see as the really big opportunities for the NHS as an anchor institution uh, to contribute to, po to improving population health? I think that's a, a very important question. I think it's really about the work that can be done for people to see their, their physical health first and foremost and their mental health and the other aspects of that in terms of how it connects to them. So for me, for the NHS, I think having been to local CCGs, really thinking about that model and learning from the ones that are working well and the ones that are perhaps, you know, could, could go a bit further. Again, it comes back to the language that's used, I think, that it's a real opportunity to think about the types of topics that are being covered within those spaces and how the NHS is sharing information. And where should people look if they want to find out more about the NHS as an anchor institution and some sort of guidance or, or um, resources that might be useful? I think it really depends on what specific element they want to know more about, but I would say that perhaps the online resources, if people are digitally, digitally literate, that's the best space. Um, but I also think in terms of, um, as Nicola mentioned, social prescribers play an important role. But I think all of us as well in terms of when we are working out and about in local communities, we play such an important role in terms of signposting and conveying that information. And that we have these organic conversations as we have these relationships with people where we can convey that information in a way that is more perhaps resonating with them and where they're at. And that, that's another theme that I suspect we'll come back to, that uh, population health is not driven just by public health teams. There's actually a really wide workforce that's involved. Definitely. You might not even realise that part of their role is, is promoting health, but we'll maybe come back to that. I want to come back to the examples uh, that I asked you to think of an example of something that's really essential or crucial in a local system if it's going to be effective in, in improving population health. And uh, I think, who shall I start with? I think I'll start with Sally. <laughs> um, well, we, we've done a lot of work with our NHS partners on this um, and we have come up with a framework for what we think really makes the biggest difference in helping local areas and local places to work well and integrate effectively together. Um, and we've published something jointly with um, ADAS directors of adult social services and NHS clinical commissioners, NHS providers um, and NHS confederation, um, which sets out the things that would make the biggest difference and that includes shared leadership so agreeing what the outcomes are that you're all you're all aiming for and that relationship that I talked about earlier um, and shared outcomes and then flowing from that a sense of shared system so you need to get the what you're doing together first right um, before you try and sort out your system so that everybody's coordinating working well and and sharing data effectively because if you haven't got the relationships right at the top actually it's very difficult to get your popular population based approach right um, and the other thing I would say is that um, we know that that care for across a population needs to be kind of um, place-based. So it, it, it all depends on, on what you've got in your local place, 
what your priorities are, what the needs of your population are, and a common understanding of that, as well as person-centred. So we've, we've talked a bit about the needs to meet people where they're at and listen to them and um, to try and frame the care that you're offering in terms that they define rather than the way you define it. And that sounds quite difficult to do in the context of what you said about um, pressure for, from austerity and, and funding to be able to step back like that and really sort of think about how are we going to work together, how do we understand the needs of our community? Um, so I, I think that the hardest bit actually is making sure that when you've done that, which of course you need to make space for and that is difficult but it's always been difficult. Once you've done that, actually, one of the difficult things is making sure that when you've worked out what your priorities are, you can collectively make sure the resources go there. So when we talk about social prescribing, um, we might fund the mechanisms for the coordination and the signposting and so on. But actually, unless we've funded the services to which you're signposting and unless we've got the provision in place and the training in place for people to provide it, um, you're not signposting people anywhere that they can get the support they need and so a lot of it a lot of actually making it happen does depend on the resources being available and and that if it's not about new money is about reprioritization of resources and of course that's difficult so that's a good a, a good point i think that we often talk about relationships being so important but actually it's following through with commitment mm -hmm. to actually uh, fund priorities and to remove barriers to funding priorities yeah. and also to stick with it so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, new initiatives don't always help um, because if you want to make a difference in a place and to a community you need to do that over years not months mm -hmm. and definitely not weeks and I think sometimes in central government and some of our big central organisations, we want to announce an initiative and then we'll put a plan in, plan in place and then we'll move on to the next thing. And if you want to make the real difference, you need to stick with it for years and yes. you need to look at how it's going and keep talking to people and each other in, in local leadership situations to make sure it's working. Great. Um, Alex, what would your example be of something that, that's really essential for a, for a local system in population I think health? it builds on, on what we've just heard so, so in our world, some of, the, some of the best practice we see is kind of rooted around, particularly community interest, community interest company held primary care, where there's an organisation at the heart of a kind of homeless set of services, a health organisation, able to act as that glue in a, in a particular location. So Bradford, Bevan Healthcare in Bradford, absolutely amazing. Arch in Brighton, these amazing specialists. At the heart of them, they've got a primary care contract to deliver a service. To a, to a very excluded, profoundly unwell population, but they've become a hub and they've drawn in local voluntary sector services around meaningful activity. They've drawn in a, a mental health contract. They've drawn in from us a pathway team into the hospital. They've become these physical embodiments of a kind of a, a gluey institution connecting different bits of the system, but also a hub. And again, it requires really enlightened commissioning. All of, the, all of those examples, the local commissioners have pushed as hard as they can against NHS commissioning boundaries to push particularly the time of contracts out into the future because to build the relationships to get the drugs workers to pop in on a Tuesday at the same time that you've got your mental health um, PD session coming in because you've got patients with both personality issues and drugs, drugs you, that takes a long time to put together and all the contracts will be different and some of them will, the services will be able to outreach but unless they've got time to create those relationships, it doesn't happen. And where we see really, really good practice is this kind of slightly freewheeling, but long-term commissioned primary care, able to be that focus. And then around them, those examples, they've got very good supportive relationships with the local authority as well. So it's kind of, it becomes a rooted institution. So, so you're talking about brilliant clinical leadership and really exploiting that as a sort of first point of contact that different yeah. population groups will often have with the system yeah. to make the connections. An amazing innovation then comes, so the Bright colleagues working with another charity, Just Life, have created a, a really lovely little extra bit of floating support for patients who are homeless coming out of hospital, get six months of a key worker who they've met at the hospital bedside, who's a charity worker who couldn't be at the bedside unless they'd been accredited. So there's a whole load of governance you have to work out just to make that simple thing happen. And then the local authority putting the money into... F so all of those things take a long time to piece together and then are lost almost... 
the, the, whim, the whimsical cut or slice of a commissioner's pen can throw that away so easily. Um, so again, that service, and they spend a lot of time connecting with local leaders and local commissioners in particular. So, so your point is well made that it's not just the providers and the clinical leadership, it's got to be reflected as well in the role of the commissioners yeah. having a long-term view, allowing yeah. flexibility to be responsive yeah. and develop And I think we begin to see in, our, in the world of homeless and inclusion health, some commissioners beginning to see this. I mean, the health issues we see are so extreme and so grave. And the, the visibility of homelessness on the street is driving people towards the issue, mm. which is good in a way. Um, and that's... And, and there are some really enlightened people out there saying, well, how do we put all of this together? And what's nice is there is some practice which we can point out and say, well, here are some really bright sparks which you can start with. And you mentioned Bradford and Brighton as two yeah. examples. Yeah. So. Nicola, from NHS England, what would you like to see in each system? Yeah, so it's kind of picking up a bit the points that Sally and Alex have already made, but we work very closely with a range of um, STPs and ICSs to deliver personalised care, um, we call it our demonstrator sites. Um, and it often really comes back to relationships and really building those relationships over time, but with those kind of different players in the system. So we kind of mentioned bits around clinicians, commissioners, BCSE, local authorities. It's really kind of building those across, across all those different areas. Um, and we also... Um, we do a lot of work with, uh, with people with, li with lived experience around building peer leaders, as I mentioned, and really co-producing uh, everything we do at the national level. Uh, so all our policy and strategy we co-produce. Um, and I think that's a really important part of what needs to be done locally as, as part of the, the kind of relationship building to really kind of make that change and really integrate services, really have that voice of lived experience, because often that can really help bring together the conversations in a different way and around the person and really kind of make that change. So really making that a priority locally um, and bringing that voice in is, is really important um, and I mentioned earlier around our skills building for people with, with lived experience because I think that is important to give people with lived experience the knowledge skills and confidence to really make that positive contribution and things um, and really kind of feeling like they're really making a positive difference. The other quick thing I'd mention as well is what, from what we've learned is sometimes the language can be a bit of a barrier mm -hmm. and I think sometimes the NHS can talk a certain language that everyone in the NHS yeah, understands. Always talks um, <laughs> but actually how does that adapt that language um, when it's, you know, and to kind of get some common principles. That's one of the top tips we've been given from the sites we've been working with is like how do we kind of get over some of those barriers and often it's a lot, it's, you know, requires just that different, co that conversation but we often don't do, we often don't make time for that but if we want to get some common principles and some common ways of working and uh, common goals that we want to achieve together, we do need to make sure we all understand what we're talking about and we're on the same page. And uh, I think that's a really important message to give because co-production actually is quite difficult mm. across a whole system as opposed mm. to just in an individual service. Mm. Uh, again, where would you point people to look for resources or for guidance on what, 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 what would help them? Because it is genuinely difficult. It is genuinely difficult. And I feel like I've learned a lot as well through, through my career in the NHS around the difference between engagement and co-production. And I think sometimes we get the two confused mm -hmm. and people think they're doing co-production, but they're doing engagement. And they're saying, you know, we've, we've developed this already and, you know, they're sort of sharing and things. Whereas actually what, what we, we try and do and what we... Um, we you know would like to other people to do and we know we've seen some great examples of it is actually kind of letting go a bit more and actually talking to people about what their priorities are developing things much more in tandem and sometimes it, it you know that control that you need to leave is, is quite hard that you need to let go of that kind of control and it can be quite hard it depends you know when you've been so used to kind of having that um, and as part of your professional role um, it can feel quite uncomfortable but that is a kind of process I feel like I've been through a bit and you know I think you know it's something that's really important to do genuine co-production we do have quite a lot of materials at NHS England NHS Improvement to support people um, when they're developing their co-production approach um, so they're available on our website people are very welcome to use those and as I mentioned we, we do have a peer leadership process program already that people can access uh, to develop those skills but we're also moving to more online uh, version as well so it's an online and face-to-face -to, -face to, to help more people get the benefits from that to really build those peer leaders. Great thank is you. It, I just is coming in on that the kind of peer leadership patient engagement I mean it's very very important but it's full of quite difficult paradoxes so we in our world have the challenge sort of to bring some of our patients into these discussions is, is excellent and can be very very powerful but if we're not going to help them with their housing today, with their health today, what is, we're using them and putting them back on the street. This, this is awful. And the system doesn't seem to have any way 
to deal with that because if you want to get the real experiences, you know, to go where people are now when they're in a really bad place and the system then puts them back in a bad place. Thank you for your input. Yeah. Um, we'll go off and make our plan. Yeah. And it doesn't really, unless you can also create structures which enable people themselves to get some benefit and some change from it. Yeah. Again, you're kind of making use of people without, yeah. without, they may have input to your ideas, but if you've left them in the same position, yeah. which is a bad position, yeah. you haven't done anything to change. Yeah. And this maybe comes back to the theme that Sally started about thinking ahead to your commitment to what you're actually going to do as opposed to just thinking in the abstract about developing a population health approach, but actually what are the specific actions and funding that's going to be made available. Mm. Laura. Isabel, do you have an example of what you would like to see? I suspect some of it's already been said, but mm. um, what, what would you really uh, see as essential in a local population health system? Sure. Um, I'd like to point to two examples, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, the first is one I've observed, the second is one I'm more directly involved in. Um, so I think if we look to what Coventry are doing as a, as a Marmot City, it's really interesting and really fascinating and one of the few examples I've seen of different parts of the system really working very closely together and uh, looking... Can you explain what a Marmot City is, just to make sure everyone yes, knows? Yes, so um, there's 12 Marmot Cities in the UK and they are very much committed to seeing the wider determinants of health as the most important and addressing the, the things that are, you know, keeping people like fueling health inequalities so in terms of Coventry they really look at the health of populations across the life course with poverty at the centre of that. Um, the other example I'd like to point to is what Tower Hamlets are doing in terms of their health and wellbeing strategy and that's one of the programmes we're leading on at the Young Foundation. So for me I think it's a really inspiring example of what can happen if we really look at public health from a community development perspective and as Nicola said it is deeply uncomfortable the, this working in this innovative and open way because it's a different way of doing things and we don't know what's going to happen but for me I think what is what is troubling and challenging is that a lot of us are talking about co-production and it's a, a word that is used a lot but how are we actually doing it in practice and are we and I'd like to see more leaning towards actually things being community-led and that's not to say putting the onus on people to solve problems that they didn't create necessarily but really looking at building in that participation ladder that journey of people from the outset from the moment when you ask them what's important to them in terms of their health to going through on that journey with them to them leading on change and as I said before bringing in the services and the systems to support them to do that. Really interesting thank you and I think I think uh, two things I'd maybe underline in what you've just said is is the Marmot cities are a really good network for areas to learn from each other um, which is quite important in this in this um, area, not to just sort of invent it all on all on your own, uh, and and uh, you're drawing attention as well to the question of leadership and and rebalancing the power dynamics. Uh, so I think this will be a really good area to explore further about what does that actually look like, what's it involved. So I really want to encourage our audience to continue putting questions. We've got a good list coming through. Uh, if there are specific things around leadership for population health that you'd like to explore, to to, to achieve this bringing everyone together uh, then do do uh, don't hold back with your questions uh, I have a question as well and this again is a slightly tricky one so you might need a minute to think about it uh, where would you start in population health what is your priority of a population health problem that you'd like to see at the top of the list uh, and I'll maybe start with Sally again it's a great question um, I think the answer will be different in each community uh -huh. So uh, the joint strategic needs assessment that's undertaken in each um, place will be asking that kind of question and the health and wellbeing strategy that's put in place to address those priorities is, should be the kind of means through which it's addressed at a place level. Um, but it's impossible to say that, that one will be the top priority in every area because we know that the, the demographics and the population needs of each area is very different. Sorry, and that's actually not dodging the question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good answer. And, and you're, you're, you're name checking the, the JSNA, the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, as the key to uh, getting the focus right for a local area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nicola, does that chime with you? I think. Where possible, I would look at the data and what does that tell you about kind of where people are, where, where there are cohorts potentially not well served by the current system, if, if that data is available. Often I think people do have an idea of kind of certain groups that aren't potentially being um, 
are being served well, but you know, I think looking at the data is a really helpful way to kind of know where to start and get into this problem. Um, and as Sally says, it will vary in different local areas. Some areas uh, we work with have picked certain long-term conditions. So uh, for example, diabetes or COPD, or they look at the frailty index and start with certain groups um, on, that, on that index. Um, uh, and you know, and whichever it depends what works best for that group. Some people uh, for, for for that population. Some people look at the kind of high intensity users and really just focus on that. So it's not any particular long term condition, but it's actually the kind of high intensity unit users. So I think that's the way, kind of way I'd go in and not try and solve all the kind of problems in the system. I think if you can try and start with a cohort and then build out, that is a good place to start because you can show it can be done. You can build the relationships um, and you can really make a difference that can then be built on for the future. Isabel, what would you see as the, as, as, as the priority, the starting point? And I, I suspect you'll react to uh, uh, Nicholas saying start with the data because it's not just numbers, is it? Yes, <laughs> it's not just numbers. Um, I think I would definitely look at it slightly differently in terms of you know where my expertise and, and insights lie. And I think in terms of those four pillars of population health, looking much more towards, yes, the social determinants, but also the local communities and places. And I would disagree with you to an extent in terms of we do need to be working at that hyper-local level, but always thinking, what are we learning? Because if we're going to address this across the UK, we need to see what patterns are there. Um, and in terms of pushing our work a bit further, I'd really love to, for instance, just let's take housing as an issue and address that first and foremost, because I think, Alex, you touched on this, we are working with people to improve their green spaces, to improve their, the, the kind of cohesion and connection in their community, which is fantastic, and we are seeing impacts in terms of their health and well-being. But at the end of the day, there's still a lot of them are going back to, to overcrowded and, you know, inadequate housing. So how can we learn from that and how can we, you know, really think about health as broadly as possible? But there's so, so many themes. <laughs> so I'm really glad you mentioned that because we've had a question about housing. So I was going to come on to that and ask the panel if they've got examples of really innovative or interesting or effective um, working between health and housing. We'll come back to that and it may come up in, in your uh, uh, response, Alex. But can you, can you say a bit about what you think um, it would be a good starting point? From Pathways perspective, we would say this, wouldn't we? But we think... Quite, there are good reasons to start at the most extreme edge. The people with so the, the worst people health status. with the worst health status in the most ex, the most extreme. So we published some papers in the Lancet with colleagues from UCL a couple of years ago, showing that uh, extreme multiple exclusion has a catastrophic effect on human health. No surprise there. And yet health services can do quite a lot to help people in that position. But they also need housing, <coughs> excuse me, housing, employment, relationships, all of the other good things in life to come forward around them but we think so we often say if you can get things right for some of our patients then you've probably got rather a good joined up system because their multiple complex needs are a real test of the joint because they've got COPD and diabetes and some issues relating to family trauma and they'll be poor and they'll have no housing if you can fix that then you've probably got quite a good system and it, it allows you then to create these relationships around patients who perhaps don't have quite such extreme needs but you've yeah. begun to show that you can really do something. So we would, we would certainly ask the system to look at our population. From the JSNA perspective, very often our population is hidden, by definition, won't arise in a normal approach to local data. So again, even in the JSNA level, you need to push out harder to find people who are even intentionally hit, hiding away because they won't come out of your routine data collection. And it's quite easy if you want to say, oh, there aren't any people like that here. Mm -hmm. and, we, and indeed, we can think of some places where that's almost the political endeavour is to, is to hide our population away such that perhaps they will go away. Thank just, you. Just to add as well in terms of you know, hearing from those people and understanding why and listening to their stories to really you know, shed light on the data, the things that the data doesn't tell us. Thank you. Four different perspectives. That was, that was fascinating. Uh, does ever, anyone have a good example of working across housing and health? Alex? I mean, we've been working a bit on this so that within the homelessness sector, there's a, there's a push from government and elsewhere towards what's called Housing First, which is a partly American, partly continent, European-inspired model where first for someone who is homeless, what a surprise again, you, you house them because that's their fundamental problem. But you also recognise that they have a, likely to have quite a complex set of needs as well. And you try and put a very integrated package of care around that move into housing. So it's housing first, but not only. Um, we can point to a couple of places, crisis, the national charities, some places in both Manchester and Liverpool piloting this approach. 
I think our fear is that it's proving very, very difficult in practice to get the real join up, particularly around all the health services, which need to be brigaded around people moving into their own accommodation, perhaps for the first time in a long time. And there's an expectation from the housing CLG sector, oh, well, we've done our bit, health service, you should just be turning up. And health service, no one's asked them, and there's been a, there's been a lack of join even at that level, despite the fact it's a national priority from housing policy. But, but there are some examples where the data is clear that if you do that well, it really does work. But it's, it's challenging our system because it's fundamentally asking housing services and health services and other services to rapidly join up around some patients. And that's proving hard. Thank you. So we've got about five minutes left. So I'm, I'm going to um, ask for brief responses, uh, please, so we get through uh, all the questions we've got. So not surprisingly, we've had a question about pooled budgets and how can we make sure we're organising the funding around people's needs. And we have a certain amount of experience of that between pooling budgets across health and social care. But of course, there are lots of other people that we might want to align our funding streams and pool budgets with in population health, criminal justice system, for example. Um, how can we make pooled budgets work effectively? And again, Sally, I'll maybe start with you on this. What, what, what in practical terms should, should local areas be thinking about to, to make sure they don't get fragmented funding streams uh, and to try and draw it together as much as possible? Um, well, it's a great question, um, and it's one of those age-old problems that people have struggled with, and we've argued for a long time um, on behalf of local government that what you need to think about is having place-based budgets for the whole place and um, strategic leadership that kind of works out the priorities for the place right across those budgets. Um, there are lots of examples of places which are making really good use of Section 75 arrangements to pull across health and care and um, and to kind of think about the needs of their population and align those resources um, around those needs. Um, I would say though that pooled budgets are only one of the means to the end. They're not the panacea. So pooling your budgets is not going to sort out the fact you can't work together. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can work out what your priorities are together, then actually whether or not you technically pool or you just align your budgets is probably less of an issue. Um, and so the kind of relationships are the key in, in this question so again, as well as relationships, others. Relationships, common purpose, really understanding what you want to achieve it was, is, your, is your starting point. Yeah. Alex, what about your experience? Because um, your, your client group is right between multiple different mm -hmm. bits of the public sector. Uh, what's your experience of what works in, in drawing together the funding streams? Again, it's the same. It's where relationships are formed, where some, I mean, I have to say the big cities prove much more challenging for us in terms of trying to get coherent action than some of these places where you've got a single CCG and a single city council and a single provider turn out to be just easier to mobilise because there's fewer people who need to talk to each other. So, and that's our challenge, for example, in London or the big conurbations is there's just too, it's, there's, and the NHS we can see with the STPs is trying to, to create some new smaller, smaller but larger than local authority boundaries to deal with that, but that's hard. And the, the, I think we probably just all need to recognise that in the big conurbations, this, this work requires more time and probably more resource for those dialogues and discussions to take place. Thank you. And Nicola, briefly, uh, what's NHS England's um, view? Because we, we see a certain amount of flexibility entering the mm -hmm. system in terms yeah. of some of the rules that previously were quite rigid. Yeah, exactly. And I would, I would agree with the points that um, Sally and Alex have made around kind of relationships and, uh, and um, how that, that sort of really makes a difference. Um, I think... Uh, so we would encourage um, local areas to discuss this, align budgets where they can, uh, pool budgets where they can. I think one thing we can do more of is around the kind of some of the evidence base, because actually we've seen a lot of um, reduced costs from where, when we align some of these conversations. Pick up the conversation about housing earlier, for example. So instead of having having a carer go in every day, um, some housing adaptations. We've seen some examples of where they can um, help 
to actually kind of solve the kind of issue or that, you know, and actually people don't, wouldn't necessarily need a carer. So actually looking across the budget, it's actually better value for money. It reduces costs. And so I think us being able to kind of share some of that evidence base and kind of how that helps get people on board in that conversation and helps to kind of bring together the budgets more easily. But we're also looking at how we can do more um, centrally around getting, uh, reducing some of those barriers around regulations and things as well to kind of help pull those things. So looking at things like disabled facilities grant, um, access to work and things like that, and how can we bring those together to help with some of that kind of join up. Thank you. So we've got two minutes. So really briefly, Isabel, we've had a question about personalisation and how that can um, enable people to make choices so that the system ends up funding the right services that actually meet people's needs. What's your insight over your experience of, of how that works? Because that speaks exactly to the power dynamic you, you talked mm. about before and potentially decommissioning some established services to, to, to introduce new ones. Yes, um, so to be brief, I think it's, it is important to, to take a risk and to, to fund these types of innovative projects that are looking to do things differently and addressing gaps where things haven't been working so far. But in terms of, just to touch on briefly, inverting those power dynamics, we need time. We need time to show that this is working and also to be employing the tools that allow us to really hear from as broad a range of people as possible. So if we're going to work with people to find out what's going to determine our focus for health and wellbeing, we have to keep testing it back, finding out is this relevant and keep growing it and reiterating on it. So listening, not a one-off uh, exercise. Absolutely not. Uh, this common theme of stick with it mm -hmm. uh, and... and um, yeah, I think, I think that's a great answer. Thank you, thank you so much. You. We're going to run out of time now. So uh, I hope you found this, this conversation interesting. Uh, we're going to leave you now with uh, our new population health animation, which is on the King's Fund website. Feel free to share it and use it as a good explainer of what we actually mean by population health. Thank you to all of our panel, uh, and, and thank you for watching. Uh, goodbye. Being healthy is more than just not being ill. It's about our physical, mental and emotional well-being. While access to traditional health services is important, in reality, there are many factors that affect our health and well-being. Our individual actions and social connections, the places and communities that we're part of, the services that are delivered in our neighbourhoods and the decisions made by local and national government all play a vital role in keeping us healthy. John is 50 and has worked as a builder for over 30 years. Recently, he's developed arthritis and is visiting the GP frequently for pain relief. Unable to work full time, he's become cut off from friends and colleagues and is finding it hard to get out and about and look after himself. Mira's eight and has asthma and chest problems. There are no green spaces within easy reach of her home and her school playground is by a congested road. Medication helps, but she misses school some days, making it hard to keep up with her work and friends. These issues can't simply be treated through healthcare. John and Mira are both receiving high quality professional treatment, but there are many other factors that affect their health and well-being. John's life changed when he chatted to his housing officer on a routine visit. She encouraged him to join a walking football group run by the local leisure centre. Slowly, he started seeing the benefits of gentle exercise and he began to enjoy being part of a group with his new teammates. He returned to work part-time, adapting his role to suit him with the support of his employer. And although he still has health issues, he's feeling happier and healthier than he has in years. As for Mira, after a campaign by a parent and teacher community action group, the local council decided to close the roads around the school during drop-off and pick-up times, improving the air quality in the area. Mira does still need her inhaler, but she no longer misses school as often because of her condition. The campaign also inspired the council's Green Spaces team to propose a new initiative, designed with the public. Everyone in the neighbourhood will soon benefit from more cycle routes and open space to walk and play in. Healthy communities are defined by much more than our individual actions or access to traditional healthcare. Green spaces, social activities, education and employment opportunities, healthy food, good housing and transport all play a hugely important role. To prevent illness and improve the health and well-being of local communities, we need to consider all these aspects and more. 
This is called a population health approach. In some areas, people, local groups and services are already working together to improve population health. This isn't easy, but by strengthening partnerships across communities, businesses, local government and the NHS, and with support and adequate funding from central government, we can make a difference. Find out what the King's Fund is doing at www.kingsfund.org.uk forward slash population health.